the 22nd Sunday after Trinity. Lord, we beseech thee to keep thy household, the church, in continual godliness, that through thy protection it may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve thee in good work to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Verse 4 of Hymn 296. A new creation comes to life and grows as Christ's new body takes on flesh and blood. The universe restored and whole will sing. Alleluia. Alleluia. Well, we turn our attention to a book that we had to read in a grad course of theology at uh, Villanova systematics course uh, does God exist in the book common was passionate almost reckless and it's daring King's best Kung's best and most helpful to date there are some shocking paragraphs so no doubt about that it's a long book 868 pages and he's quite the scholar did his in Paris on Bart does God exist? And the answer for today, published in 1981, well, that's about when I was there, went back to 79, Ad Maiorum Deum Gloriam. He studied, he, this book was originally intended to be complimentary on being a Christian. I think I've got that on the shelf. Uh, <clears throat> it emerged, first of all, from the necessity of keeping the earlier book to a manageable size, then grew in response to the need of venturing more deeply into the question of God and of carrying out more thoroughly a discussion of atheism and nihilism. Well, I remember that. Wow. Went off on a bunny rabbit trail on Frederick Nietzsche for a little while as a result of this book. What has become increasingly clear to the author during these long years following his student days is recapitulated in the present book. A number of colleagues have helped me with their advice. This I have acknowledged in sections I asked them to read. Professor Walter Jens, Professor Ludger Oning Hanhoff, outstanding knowledge of history, academic assistants, libraries, got a lot of names here. He's a priest in good standing, it might be Ed, but they've taken his license away to t teach theology. But he's retained his academic position in Tübingen. The aim of the book, reason or faith, I think, do I therefore exist, Rene Descartes? Shattered unity, I believe, do I therefore exist, Blase, Pascal? The fundamental certainty of faith, faith as re basis of reason, Augustine, Jansenism, tracts of atheism, is atheism. Humanistic, political, scientific, against rationalism for authority, epistemological question, Wittgenstein, Karl Popper, Thomas Kuhn, Kuhn, we're having a long time. No understanding of God, God in the world, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, from deism to pantheism. Atheism, post-atheism, post God and history, phenomenology of spirit, system and history, secular and historical God. There, there are some glorious moments in this book, by the way. It's a Roman Catholic scholar, but Augusta Comte, Pierre Tillard de Chardin, God's coming to be, Alfred North Whitehead, Challenge of Atheism, God, a projection of man, old Feuerbach. Critique of Feuerbach. Critique of the critique. God, a consolation serving vested interests, Karl Marx. Critique of Marx, critique of critique. 
God, an infantile illusion, Sigmund Freud, critique of Freud, critique of the critique, interim results, nihilism, consequence of atheism, a atheism, the rise of nihilism, Darwin, Strauss's Philistine optimism, Schopenhauer's pessimism, Nietzsche's own way. What is nihilism? Descartes. Pascal and the controversy. Was Nietzsche a nihilist? Critique of nihilism. What Christianity can learn, what non Christians can learn, interim results. <clears throat> yes to reality clarifications, fundamental trust or mistrust, explication. Yes to God, alternative to atheism, transcendence, transcending man, Ernest Bloch, Block. Martin Heidegger, Theological Discussions, Vatican I, Knowledge of God by Faith, Karl Barton, Proving God, More Than Pure Reason, Immanuel Kant, God Exists, New Openness, God is a Hypothesis as Ground of Reality, Consequence, Yes to the Christian God, the God of the non-Christian religions, the God of the Bible, the living God, God in this world, the God of Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, God is the spirit, notes, index. This was a good book. I didn't agree with everything, of course. Um, and I read it repeatedly. So I read it several times as we had to write papers on it and take exams on it, actually. I think it was exams we took. Does God exist? This question applies another. Who is God? This book is meant to give an answer to both questions and give reasons for this answer. The question mark will be taken seriously, but that will not be the end of it. Yes to God? For many believers, this has not been obvious for a long time. No to God? Neither has this been obvious for a long time to unbelievers. Yes or no, many are at a loss between belief and unbelief. They are undecided, skeptical. We disagree there. They are doubtful about their belief. No, they're not. But they are also doubtful about their doubting. No, they're not there either. And there are many who are even proud of their doubting. Yet there remains a longing for certainty. Certainty? Whether Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, Christians or Jews, God or atheists, the discussion today runs right across old denominations and new ideologies. We may, however, really begin to wonder if Christianity has not come to an end. Is it not all over with belief in God? Has religion any future? Can we not have mortality even without religion? Is not science sufficient? Is not religion developed out of magic? Will it not perish in the process of evolution? Is not God from the outset a projection of man for our bot? Opium of the people, Marx. <coughs> Resentment of those who've fallen short, Nietzsche. Illusions of those who've remained infantile, Freud. Has atheism been proved and is nihilism not irrefutable? Have not even theologians finally given up proving God's existence? Or are we supposed to believe even without reasons? Simply believe? Can we not doubt everything except mathematics and what we can observe, weigh, and measure? Would not the ideal be mathematical certainty? Or is there simply no ground for certainty? And even if God existed, would he be personal or impersonal? Describe him as personal would be naive, but an impersonal God would be an abstraction. Or ought we to prefer the wisdom of the East, the silence of Buddhism before the ineffable absolute? In the last religion, are not all religions the same? Would it not be more intellectually honest to stop short at the God of the philosophers? Why should the God of the Bible be better? God is world creator and world completer. What do we know anyways about the beginning and the end? 
and even more, what can we make of the Christian God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Trinity? What is all this that we're supposed to believe? Yet why then believe in God? Why not simply believe in man, society, the world? Why in God and not simply in human values, liberty, fraternity, love? Why add trust in God to trust in ourselves, prayer to work, religion to politics, the Bible to reason, the hereafter to the here and now? What is belief in God supposed to mean anyway? What can it mean today? We are not deluding ourselves. Atheism, atheism today demands an account of our belief in God as it never did in the past. In the course of modern times, this belief has become increasingly on the defensive. And today has often been silenced, at first with a few people and then with more and more. Atheism as a mass phenomenon, however, is a phenomenon of the most recent times, our own times. The question is forced upon us, how did it get so far? What are the causes? Where did the crisis break out? These are difficult but fascinating problems in which the French Revolution is just as much involved as the theory of relativity. Natural science as much as politics, epistemology as much as psychoanalysis, history of religion and criticism of religion. Is there anything at all that is not involved? But how can everything be answered at once in view of the amounts, immense amount of material that has been deposited by the current of modern times in view of all the questions and problems that must all be answered simultaneously if they are to be effectively answered. This may also serve to explain the size of the book. To find a reasoned answer, we have to look back to the beginning of modern times. But we are not writing a history of philosophy, showing how philosophers beget philosophers and ideas give birth to ideas. We are giving an account not of the history of ideas, but of concrete human beings made up of flesh and blood with their doubting, struggling, and suffering, their belief and unbelief, with all the questions that still stir us today. It is amazing to see how many have wrestled with the question of God from Descartes, Pascal, and Spinoza, by way of Kant and Hegel up to Vatican I, and Karl Barth to William James, Tillard de Chardin, Whitehead, Heidegger, Bloch, Augustine and Aquinas are involved in this history just as much as the Reformers, Jansenism and the Enlightenment, as later Comte and Schopenhauer, Darwin and Strauss, Positivism and Existentialism, and finally the linguistic philosophy of Carnap. And Wittgenstein, let's not even go there. The critical theory of Adorno and Horkheimer and Frankfurt and Popper and Albert's critical rationalism. If we continually turn to history, this is not in order to set out facts, to honor great minds or tell stories. In a word, not for the sake of the past, but in order to create a distance from the present and at the same time to come closer again to it. We're giving an account of the past in order to understand the present better, to understand ourselves in all dimensions, mind and heart, consciousness and subconsciousness, history, society, culture. Does God exist? We are putting all our cards on the table here. The answer will be yes, God exists. And as human beings in the 20th century, we certainly can reasonably believe in God, even in the Christian God. And perhaps more easily today than a few decades or even a few centuries ago. <clears throat> For after so many crises, it is surprising how much has been clarified and how many difficulties in regard to belief in God has been cleared up. 
even though some people are still not aware of the fact. Today, there is no necessity to be against God merely because we are for geocentrism or evolution, for democracy and science, for liberality or socialism. No, we can be forthrightly for true freedom, equality, and fraternity, for humanity, liberality, and social justice, for humane democracy and controlled scientific progress just because we believe in God. Some time ago, an English Nobel Prize winner is supposed to have answered the question whether he believed in God. Of course not. I'm a scientist. This book is sustained by the hope that a new age is dawning when the very opposite answer will be given. Of course, I'm a scientist. <laughs> when it is appropriate, we shall not hesitate to profess our faith, but there will be no eulogizing, no preaching. The reader has the right, first of all, to be informed and oriented in regard to the present state of the question. We should also receive answers, unequivocal, though incomplete answers. They should provoke a free discussion for or against a rationally justifiable decision, and perhaps also a revision of a decision. One last point. The books on being of God and God, does God exist are mutually complementary, and we hope merge smoothly one into the other. When repetitions seem appropriate, particularly, of course, toward the end of these books, no attempt was made to avoid them. It should be possible to read and fully understand each book for its own sake. In the present work, the important thing for me was to set out as lucidly and consistently as possible the meaning of belief in God in its totality, even in some particular questions, this meant pointing to different ways of thinking rather than making ready-made solutions. Okay, let's go here. Reason or faith? God's existence is questioned today, but our problem is not simply to cope with the question. There remains the struggle of a different kind with the insecurity of human existence which has existed from time immemorial. Since the emergence of a modern rational man, there has been an almost desperate struggle with the problem of human certainty. Where, we wonder, is there a rock-like, unshakable certainty on which all human certainty can be built? Going through some blank pages here, page two. I think, do I therefore exist? Rene Descartes. It is not surprising that mathematicians in particular have always had a special interest in an unconditional, absolute certainty in the realm of life and knowledge. Accustomed to demands for certainty, they could not fail to be fascinated by the evident a priori conclusions independent of experience that can be reached in mathematics. Ought it not to be possible, outside the admittedly very abstract field of pure numbers and pure possibilities, Ought it not to be possible also in the concrete reality of life to ascertain the truth with quasi-mathematical certainty so that it is immune from all the fluctuations of private and public opinion? <clears throat> in the modern age, mathematical certainty, excluding all doubts, become the object of philosophers' yearning. With a new ideal of knowledge, a new age, an age of calculation, of experimenting, of method, of exactitude, and the natural science came into existence. The ideal of mathematical certainty. <clears throat> there is no one who personifies the modern ideal of absolute mathematical philosophical certainty better than the brilliant inaugurator of an analytical geometry and modern philosophy, 
His name is Cartesius. Became synonymous with Clarté, a geometrically exact clarity of thought. <clears throat> but the man himself, as person and philosopher, <clears throat> nevertheless remained a great mystery. Was this René Descartes, 1596 to 1650, originally a physicist or a metaphysician? Was he a good Christian or a Cartesian rationalist? Was he a modern apologist for the traditional faith or an initiator of modern unbelief, rightly placed on the index by Rome and condemned by the Dutch Reformed Synod? necessity of an exact method. This pupil of the Jesuits, sickly from his youth onward, accustomed all his life to lying in bed till late in the morning, invited at the age of 54 by Queen Christina of Sweden to travel in the care of an admiral with a warship to ice-cold Stockholm in the grip of winter, contracted a fatal pneumonia when he had to appear at 5 a.m. each day to discuss philosophy with the Queen. From the very beginning, Descartes felt as much repelled by the traditional scholastic textbook philosophy as he was attracted by math mathematics because of the certainty and evidence of the reasonings. What was the use of a philosophy with a basis of natural science that had been proved with increasing clarity by Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo. This was the question he had to face. Descartes justifies his departure from tradition in an account of his life that is both intensely personal and carefully composed, written with supreme detachment and literary brilliance. This comes at the beginning of his first publication, Discours de la Méthode, the method of rightly directing one's reason and of seeking truth in the sciences, to which he added the diatropics, meteors, and geometry as essays in the method. Coming after La Institutione de la Religion Chrétienne, 1560, by the reformer Jean Calvin, the second, this second literary monument of French prose to become a classic contributed in no slight degree to the abandonment of language, Latin as the language of educated people. For us, however, it is useful particularly for the problems of the present time that this founder of modern thought was able to describe what paths I have followed and to present my life as it were in a picture in order that everybody may be able to judge. Descartes, and this is why he is the first personality with whom we shall be particularly concerned compels us modern men to reconsider thoroughly the question, especially of the existence of God, the relationship of faith, reason, and certainty, theology, philosophy, and natural sciences. The outwardly docile aristocratic student treated with deference, but secretly a rebellious admirer of Galileo, found himself at the end of his studies entangled in so many doubts and errors that he gave up study entirely. Unlike the scholars in their ivory towers, he resolved to seek, not to seek after any science, but what might be found within myself or in the great book of the world. So I spent the rest of my youth in travel in frequenting courts and armies, mixing with people of various dispositions and ranks, collecting a variety of experiences, of proving myself in the circumstances where fortune placed me, and in reflecting always on things as they came up, 
in a way that might enable me to derive some profit from them. The two books in which medieval man had sought truth, the book of nature and that of the Bible, appear to be replaced here by those of modern man, the book of the world and that of his own self. After taking a degree in law, he then opened up the great book of the world, at first in Paris, as a financially independent cavalier, a good dancer, rider, swordsman, gambler, but secretly preoccupied with mathematical and philosophical problems. And after that, he was continually traveling in Holland, Germany, Austria, and Hungary as a soldier, a respected unpaid volunteer with the rank of an officer. At the same time, however, less an actor than a spectator with a special liking for his quiet winter quarters where he had time for reflection. It was in such winter quarters in Ulm on the Danube on November 10, 1619, during a night of mental exaltation and stirring, prophetic dreams that a decisive turning point came into Cart's life. On the 23-year-old there dawned, as he thought from above, the light of a marvelous insight as a germinal idea for his future work, the revelation of a science admirably, the ideal of a new homogeneous universal science that could expound clearly and unequivocally with the aid of mathematical geometric method, the laws of both nature and mind, physics as well as metaphysics. Whatever Descartes may have thought about it all, a new age had dawned in which mathematics and the natural science would play a different role. Did not all developments up to that point did not the way of thinking introduced by Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo call for a comprehensive, mathematically certain systematization in the philosophy of nature and the mind? The overwhelming experience of his vocation so gripped him that in the very same night he vowed to make a pilgrimage to Loretto in Italy something that simply did not fit in with the cliches about Descartes, the rationalist. After abandoning his career as an officer, actually carried out his promise in the course of a great journey through half Europe. Later in 627, when he had settled again in Paris, he entered for the first time publicly into philosophical discussion on the occasion of a lecture by Monsieur de Chandu, in the presence of the apostolic nuncio, expounded the principles of a new philosophy which he claimed could lead to a firm and certain knowledge. Cardinal Pierre de Berulle was present on this occasion. This great founder of the oratory and of French spiritual theology, unlike the Roman theologians, had adopted a friendly attitude towards Galileo's opinions and now evidently set his hopes on the young Descartes. On the latter, he officially placed the obligation of dedicating himself to the new philosophy. Did not Christian faith, too, need a new foundation, a new philosophical substructure for theology, a new Aristotle? Here a new alliance could be established between the new, allegedly unchristian, mathematical, mechanistic science and philosophy on the one hand, and the representative particularly of a spiritual theology on the other, against the traditional textbook theology and against the nature mysticism of the Renaissance, Renaissance latently neo-pagan in the eyes of the oratorians. How very different might the history of Christendom been if Rome, 
the opportunity had been sieged for understanding between theology and natural science. Descartes was to be the first outstanding thinker of modern times, whose work, unlike the new philosophical attempts of the Renaissance, <clears throat> was to make a lasting impression on the modern consciousness. Among the papers found after Descartes' death in Stockholm were the rules for the direction of the mind, reguli ad directionum ingenii. And here we've come to an end. <clears throat> Ib 297, descend, O spirit purging flame, brand us this day with Jesus' name, confirm our faith, consume our doubt, sign us as Christ within and without. Let us pray. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Godspeed.